the mouth of the River Severn, Britain's longest river. That bridge carries the M4 motorway linking England to Wales. Hard to imagine, but all this water started here, 354 kilometres upstream on a boggy mountain top in Wales. All rivers start as rain. The Cambrian Mountains, where the Severn starts, are very wet. It's all these raindrops that soak into the ground and then become a stream. Where the stream first emerges is called the source. So the old people told me the, but the told Ian Rees farmed Welsh mountain sheep here for 63 years. We would bring them up here somewhere around about the beginning of April and we would take them down somewhere around about the end of October. Here at Plinlimon, the river is only 21 and a half kilometers from the Irish Sea but finding the easiest route downhill, the Severn sets off in the opposite direction and takes the long way round via Shrewsbury, Worcester and Gloucester before flowing out into the Bristol Channel. And we're going to follow it. In the river's upper course, it only cuts a small channel, running through a valley with steep sides and a very narrow floor. It zigzags around the interlocking spurs of the hillside and when it reaches rocks, flows around them. Depending on the amount of rainfall and the downhill gradient, it can flow very fast. As it flows downhill, the river wears away tiny bits of rock and soil from its bank. This process is called erosion. The river flows over many different types of rock, some harder than others. When an area of soft rock sits between two bands of hard rock, it erodes the soft rock away faster than the hard rock, creating a waterfall. The power of the river is one of the reasons for the sighting of the first town on the Severn, Clanedlois, a town once famous for the production of flannel, a soft material made from wool. The flannel industry was very important to this town because up this river there would have been five flannel mills being driven by water, but of course the river had a dam high above which turned a water mill. And the water mill, the water mill would drive the machinery in the factory. I remember coming when I was a young boy that father and I brought our wool to be made into flannel and clothing, etc. Flannel was produced here until 1937. The mill is now Riverside Flats. Uh, we're in Newtown in Powys on the banks of the River Severn. Uh, we're currently walking along the flood defences of the town. Um, I'm on my way to survey a housing site. Steve Jones works for Ordnance Survey. The world around us is constantly changing. Houses are being built, roads are being built, and rivers like the River Severn here are changing also. They're changing their course. And in the case of Newtown, there's been a big flood defence scheme built in the 1960s so that the river didn't flood the town. It's important that these new features and the changes in these features are mapped. And it's my job as part of a team of 300 surveyors that are based around the country to put these new features on the map. Steve first surveyed this site a year ago, but more houses have recently been built, which aren't yet mapped. So what I'm going to do is survey these new houses in relation to the old houses by using the field light, which works out angles and distances, um, and I have my digital map ready on my pen computer here. The first thing I need to do is work out where I am in relation to the old houses, and I'll do that by taking a measurement using the field light. Having worked out exactly where he is on the ground and on his map, 
Steve now surveys the new house. Okay. Right now I need to take an angle and a measurement to all the new corners on this house. So I've got my three corners of my building. I'll now need to join these three points up. It's not all high-tech equipment, and with the new house plotted, Steve now measures the access road with his trusty tape. Measurements complete, he updates his survey. The new houses beside the seven, now well and truly on the map. come past small rapids, goes round be big bends, meanders its way down the river. Someone who knows this stretch of river well is Neil Richardson from Red Ridge Centre. In Welshpool here, the main use of the river would probably be people in canoes. Don't see many other boats on this section, it's so shallow. Other people, you see fishermen on the side of the river and people playing and swimming in the summer months. The middle course of a river has a wider channel and a gentler gradient. The valley is broader and the river bends from side to side. These bends are called meanders and, as Neil's party will discover as they canoe downstream, the current flows fastest around the outside edge. If you look at the map, Bridge North is actually two towns, Low Town and High Town. Low Town is on the banks of the river, and High Town is up there, on top of that 30 metre cliff. It might seem a mad idea to build a town on such different levels, but Bridge North has flourished because of its geography, not in spite of it. This is High Town, the site of a Saxon castle with a strategic view of the river. And this is Low Town, built beside the Severn, benefiting first-hand from the wealth the river trade generated. But the people of Bridge North were forever climbing steps, and so, in 1890, a plan was hatched to build a funicular railway straight up the cliff. Remember our map? Watch as we climb away from the 3D world of Lowtown. As we approach High Town, we have a bird's eye or plan view of Low Town, the same view that is translated onto the map. During the summer months, with little rain and low water levels, the Severn at Budley makes a tranquil scene. In the winter, it's a different picture, and built on a floodplain right beside the river, the town is in danger of flooding after winter rainstorms. One of the worst floods was in winter 2000. And the river was up to five metres above its normal level, and the tea rooms part of this was underwater, with only the word merchant above the surface. Roger Presswood works for the Environment Agency, and led the team that were charged with designing flood defences for the town. But how do you protect riverside homes from such severe flooding without building a huge wall right in front of them? We could have built a tunnel to bypass the town, built a dam to hold the water back, or built walls through the town to hold the river away from the town during flooding season. None of these seem suitable. With the river flowing at six and a half kilometres per hour, they knew that it took 36 hours for torrential rain in the Welsh mountains to reach Budley as flood water. So the solution they chose was a portable barrier, and each time there's a flood alert, they've a day and a half to erect it. It was tested for real in the floods of February 2004 and November 2005, and successfully kept the town dry.
Chris Witts first went through the lock from the Severn up into Gloucester Docks, age 16, on a tanker barge. In those days, the River Severn was very much a commercial waterway. It was the main highway for carrying goods. It was pre-motorway days. So there was lots of commercial traffic on the river, lots of barges. And we on the tanker barge used to go all the way down to Swansea, which is right down the end of the Bristol Channel near the Atlantic Ocean, and to load petrol and to bring it right inland to Gloucester and then up the river to Worcester. It was one big trip. Sadly, uh, all the big tanker barges, they finished trading on the Severn about uh, early 1970s. And for one good reason, they built motorways in England. Just about to open the gates, mind. Right, it's time we move. The M5 motorways run through Gloucestershire, and as soon as it was opened, all commercial traffic on the Severn stopped. All the cargoes went onto lorries on the road. What's taken its place is small pleasure craft, cabin cruisers, long boats, and it's very much a leisure river now. Leisure cruisers safely through the lock, Chris shares his memories with John, the lock keeper. Well, there's the Winsdale. To be honest, that was my favourite tanker barge, and she was the largest bars to work on this river and we're leaving Gloucester empty and there's myself there and there's a the mate washing the decks thing and there she is on her last trip loaded coming up the canal of course you can see she's got the mast up the Sharpness ship canal runs parallel to the river downstream from Gloucester it allows vessels to avoid the treacherous mud banks of the Severn's lower course here the river is tidal in fact the Severn has the second highest tidal range in the world Normally the water rises gradually as the tide comes in, but on certain days a tidal wave, or bore, races up the river. This hand is a tide coming in from the Atlantic on up the Bristol Channel into the Severn Estuary, which narrows like a funnel. And all the time the current is coming down the river from the Welsh hills. And about six miles below Gloucester, this, the two meet, and this tide coming in pushes against that water coming down and it's very strong and it pushes it forward and suddenly the tide stops but this water is pushed like a spring effect goes backwards with this big ball wave and the narrower the river becomes the higher the wave Just over two days ago, this water was part of a mountain stream, 354 kilometres away. It's shaped the landscape, powered industry, provided transport, and impacted on the lives of millions of people. Every river has tales to tell, and everyone has a river in their area. We've seen seven snapshots of the seven. Why not explore your river?